All right, should we get after it? Yeah, you want to rip? Let's go. We are here with the man himself, Ben Jones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Starting strong. <laughs> Welcome to the Pickle Pod. You know, I think I, I introduce everybody as uh, some form of nickname. We gave we gave Leia the Honey Badger nickname yesterday because uh-huh. she badger. just doesn't give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're Ben Jones. So welcome. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, maybe by the end of this, we'll give him something that's more more fitting. I like Jones. You like Jones? Comfortable with it. Jonesy? Yeah. I mean, anytime you're associated with Elise Jones, it's a great thing. Yeah. I wish I had that defense. Fair. When are you going to start diving? That will never happen. The instinct just doesn't exist inside me. I will <laughs> I will happily, I, like, I struggle to run for the ball sometimes. I'm just like, nah, too much work, let alone dive. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. It just, it doesn't, I agree. I'm in your camp. It doesn't even strike me as an option. No, like, I guess uh, that's just volleyball transfer. I guess like you're just used to diving for stuff, but that would never occur to us in any sport that we've played other than maybe baseball. <laughs> True. There are some like I think Andy Roddick won a match point against Milo Raonic. He had a break point in like the the third set of some final and won it with a diving passing shot. I think I've seen that. Yeah, and I've seen Dustin Brown dive a decent amount. Gail Monfils dives. Oh yeah. I, I mean, but those are really good athletes. <laughs> Very true. And so what, you're not calling yourself a good athlete? Not really. Yeah, no, <laughs> certainly not in that capacity. I have good eye-hand coordination, but uh, not not the Gail Monfils uh, athleticism. Right. Yeah, that's hard to, very hard to match. Mm-hmm. So. I hear we have a good list today. We, we do. We have, we have a lot. <laughs> Chicago and Slice, where do I get one of those? That's, that's a good question. It's a, it's a good this logo. Is a, this is a sick I want logo. the squeeze. I want the squeeze big time. Just nah. huge uh, orange in the middle of my chest. Or, I mean, I don't know if it's tangerine or whatever. That's a great logo. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Those are those are solid ones. I'm surprised that the slice didn't do better in MLPs like Me too. voting. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was weird. It might just I really be a like bit it. of a popularity contest. Mm-hmm. But I think as far as logos go, like, come on. It's up there. I'm almost as good as clean. <laughs> 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 I don't see a lot of slice action on social media, though. Whereas the squeeze is everywhere. Very active. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a big thing. Yeah. I think the slice what was is the pretty final? Active, was, is it the final happened? BLQK and squeeze, I think. Yeah. Well, I think yeah, that's kind of fitting. Black BLQK bears. is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The black bears are nice. It's yeah. Yeah. intimidating. Squeeze is just cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, your logo, the Pioneers logo, is just the pickleball.com logo, right? Is that the same pretty thing? Pretty much. Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, think, I think we might have a pioneer. I haven't actually seen that pioneer yet. <laughs> it's just really pickleball.com. But initially, I was shown a pioneer with like a hat, like an old fashioned like tri hat yeah, or right. whatever. I don't know if we use that still, though. Like what kind of pioneer? Mm-hmm. Some pioneers are a little controversial. These days. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we can get into it. Look at what you started. Look at what you started, Ben. Uh, no, that's, <laughs> now that's, we're off. No, that's it's what I do. I just start fires. <laughs> So, but like, here's the thing, this is the stuff that we were all talking about for probably a month before your, your, I don't, I don't think the public knows how much the pros were talking about before that. It wasn't just like out of the blue. All the pros were just like, this is, this needs to stop. Yeah. (laughs) So do you want to take us through like what, what prompted you to, to, to tweet out that delamination is a big problem? There's a couple of brands that are sure that are having paddles delaminate. Like what was, Mm -hmm. Um, so first of all, I should probably preface to anybody that doesn't really understand it completely. If you want to have a conversation about technology improving, power being more part of pickleball, we can have that conversation. But understand that that is an entirely different conversation. Okay, If you want to go out there and play with mini tennis rackets, we can have that conversation. Whether you're right or not, we can get to that later. Uh, but that's not what the issue is. The issue is you have a test that is for measuring power, what we'd call the deflection test. And we can get into how that is not a perfect test for power later as well. But basically what happens with delimited paddles is they bypass that test a little bit. You certify something when it's new, passes the test fine upon use, instead of degrading, like most paddles do, it gets better. It gets popular. Therefore it would exceed the power limit. And where it gets a little hairy is that Unfortunately, you're not supposed to use a deflection test on used paddles simply because everything increases in deflection over time when you use it. Just typically paddles do not increase in power. When a core breaks down, that doesn't happen. It gets worse. Um, So clearly, I think you can kind of see that the intent of the test is this is our maximum power. It should degrade. It should never increase. And the easiest way I get people to understand really what I mean by this is imagine MLB, right? You got your your power rules for for bats. MLB use wooden bats. 
say I certify a bat that passes all the tests. They have a lot of great tests in the MLB for power uh, that is wooden on the outside and it's an aluminum bat underneath, okay? And say after I use that, after I've certified it, I can use it in games, but after say 10 games, it's worn away a very thin layer of wood to get to the aluminum. And now I'm using an aluminum bat. Would you say, you're good, it's, it's, it's fine. You're still using a certified bat. No, of course not. You know, I would say you should quit whining. <laughs> <laughs> no, umpires are able to confiscate the bat and just set it back to testing. Uh, and we can certainly get into later, what I'm really interested in is just better testing for pickleball, uh, better power tests, because deflection is, is not a good test for power, okay? It's more like a stiffness test, honestly. Um, so really what prompted me was, I think the pros had voiced their concerns to the PPA, like, hey, this is happening, can we try to fix this? And the PPA was like, well, we kinda need to wait on USA Pickleball because we don't really know testing. That's not really our forte. USA Pickleball is a little bit slow, and for good reason. You can't make a new rule and just be like, all right, this is our new standard, and then just be like, oh, we didn't make a very good rule. Let's backtrack on that, right? So it takes time. And I think enough pros were getting frustrated to where I was like, I think the public deserves to know this is happening because it's, nothing's changing quickly enough. And honestly, I didn't expect things to change very quickly because no sport does, like MLB, back to that example. They changed their power rules as recently as 2011. That sport is like 180 years old and they're still right. changing power rules, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I just felt like it needed to be said and it's very much not about technology improvements, To just to say that again. Um, I think technology improving, paddles getting better, awesome. Bypassing a test is not in the spirit of technology improving. That, that's different. Yeah. Okay. All right. Jamie, clip that. <laughs> no, I, I tend to agree with you. I've caught like a lot of comments are saying, well, Zane, you've said in, in the past that you, we should be more libertarian with, with paddles and allow paddles to, to grow. That's true. I agree. But paddles with whenever, within whatever standard we decide is the standard. Right. 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 Like yeah. maybe we loosen by that the, standard. the standard. Yeah, you know? sure. Or maybe we retract it. You know, who knows? But that, that's a different conversation. I exactly. Think. It's a yeah. I agree. It's a completely different. Do you think it would be good to talk about? Because I, I really enjoy this. I mean, I could go on for for a long time about mechanical testing and, and how that applies to rules. Do you think it's good for people to know how the deflection test really works? Let's go for it. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so basically, what it is, it, it's good for me you, to know you how apply the deflection a, test works. You apply a force to a flat surface, and you see the the displacement of that surface. Uh, now, really what this is, is it most closely is testing the stiffness or the flexibility of material, which certainly of the, generally of the face of the material, the correct? Face. The, correct. Yeah. And really what that tells you is a stiffness or flexibility and those correlate to power, but they are not a direct measure of it. Not by any means. So let me give you an example. Rubber, it's going to deflect, right? It's also super elastic and it's going to rebound. It's going to create like this thing where you put energy into it, you get a lot of energy back. Picture a rubber band, right? We call that really elastic because you, you put energy into it by bending it, snaps back, right? Super elastic. Let me give you an example where deflection breaks down. This doesn't exemplify power at all. Silly putty, okay? You can deflect silly putty big time. It will fail the deflection test, I promise. Mm -hmm. But it's not rebounding at all. It's right. completely inelastic, okay? So that's just an example of how the deflection test is an imperfect measure of power. Uh, really what other sports use is, is called like exit speed velocity or an exit speed ratio, which basically just says you have a, a subject, say a paddle or a bat in, in baseball or really any sport you can use with the subject. Uh, you put a ball into the, the subject at some X velocity and you see what the exit velocity is, the Y velocity. And then you just take a ratio of those two things. That is the most literal form of power, right? Cause it's, here's your power in, here's your power out. And a, perfectly elastic, perfect energetic collision, which can't happen, but theoretically, is when you put it into some velocity, paddle's not moving, it exits back at that velocity. That would be perfect, mm -hmm. right? So the ratio is somewhere you know, in there below that. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can certainly establish some, some baseline. Uh, really what I'd be an advocate for is, and, and you can come and tell, tell me if you agree with this, take what we'd consider the most powerful paddle on the market today that say it maximizes deflection perfectly as a new paddle, say it's just theoretically the Selkirk O2. I think we can agree that paddle's pretty hot. Say that's our maximum new power paddle. You just put that paddle into a exit speed velocity test. Whatever that reading is, that's your new maximum. Those are your new rules. So you can transfer that test fairly easily from deflection, which is clearly imperfect, especially with used paddles. Uh, and alternatively, you can use like a coefficient of restitution test, which is more like a, a bounciness of a subject. Um, really what it measures is 
how much energy is transferred back. Just what I was kind of talking about, you know, perfect energy, how much energy is literally being bounced back into your subject. You can do either one of those. Baseball does both. How would the how would the coefficient of restitution test be different than an exit speed velocity test? Uh, the, the exit speed velocity is really only measuring velocity. The coefficient of restitution, I don't I wouldn't say is entirely necessary, but having both would be nice. Uh, the MLB does it, and it's more a measure of energetic transfer. It's energy based, not velocity based. Okay. So like the, the definition of energy is like kinetic energy. And mass velocity squared. I guess yeah, what does that so what does that look like in in practice, right? I can visualize a uh, exit velocity test, mm-hmm. like you launch a ball at a at a paddle, or you launch something at a paddle and see how how quickly it comes off. Yeah. But I can't exactly visualize a coefficient of restitution test. More complicated than we want to get into. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> Noted. <laughs> and what I would say is, velocity would work just fine because that is literally what we are dealing with in the day to day court on court thing. Mm. Coefficient of restitution is like an added measure. That's what baseball kind of added. Can you think of any reason, like maybe why that wasn't done from the beginning? Yeah, it it's seems more like expensive. The... Yeah. Okay. Um, so co- the deflection test, you really just need like a, a weight um, applied to your, your subject, and it basically just logs how much that surface indents um, on a computer. Whereas for like a ballistics test, velocity test, you need a something to fire accurately. Uh, in a controlled environment, you need a laser system to measure the velocity accurately. It's just more expensive. That's all. But, gotcha. Uh, the lab that they do the deflection test at, they actually have a ballistics like velocity test. It just is more expensive. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. You learn anything? <laughs> now mean, you can stop I, using dwell time and uh, whatever else you're using. No, and we can talk about all that too. <laughs> I'm not, I love this stuff. I'm not. No, I, I haven't figured it out yet. I'm going to have to watch this episode back. You're just talking too fast too much information for my small brain i get to too process. excited <laughs> we need to get we need to get a whiteboard on out here yeah. for you and, yeah. and the only thing right, that the whiteboard is going to say yeah. is dwell time not equal deflection I'll be like <laughs> charlie and always sunny with the uh big like bulletin board and all the ropes going everywhere <laughs> exactly yeah yeah I, I think another good example for people if you don't like the mlb example to understand is what if currently, so this is more on the spin side and power side, I guess, um, of what, what is currently happening. Because honestly, delaminated paddles are really just paddles breaking down. So the core breaks down, the surface doesn't break down with it, and therefore has more room to deflect and therefore energetically transfer back. As long as it retains its elasticity, it will transfer its energy back. That, that's the idea, whereas most paddles don't retain their elasticity. Uh, my favorite example in pickleball is, Say I certify something that is rubber underneath the surface, okay? And you can't have rubber on the surface, but you can have it underneath. Um, But the first layer certified, but wears away super quickly, picture fiberglass-esque or something similarly thin. I wear that away and suddenly I'm playing with a table tennis rubber. Are we gonna say, you're good. (laughs) It was certified, it passed deflection initially, and now you're still good. Obviously not. So really I think it's just pickleball has, you know, rules that are not perfect right now and that's fine you really rules are hard you can't make rules really well i you know in any decent amount of time like i said the mlb is still changing rules every sport is so i'd say if pickleball can get to a good test on this stuff and and other rules anytime soon they'd be way ahead of the curve Mm -hmm. yeah so i guess what does this mean for you when you're playing against somebody that is using a, a delaminated paddle. Because I think, again, some of the things that mm-hmm. you know an average viewer might not understand is just how impactful it is in the course of a point. Sure, right? Yeah. People say, it's whining, it can't be that much <laughs> of an advantage, right? Yeah. How much of an advantage is it to Well, first, I would these? say it is very much a double-edged sword, right? Yes. It, it doesn't necessarily correlate to that player even being strictly better. Okay, it can, but it doesn't necessarily say that. If you use it effectively. Yeah, sure. So you can say it's super powerful, um, but you can't control it, so does it even out? And the answer is yes and no, because sure, they may be worse, but really what it does, and it's helpful to take extremes here, give them a tennis racket, small size tennis racket that's in the dimensions. At that point, the entire game revolves around can they keep the ball in, which takes the responsibility of this match out of my hands entirely. It only relies on them. Right, so really what it does is it makes it a little more reliant on your opponent rather than you, right? And everyone wants to think that they they play a role in whether that match is won or lost. The more powerful you make something, the more you rely on your opponent's control rather than your own. So really, it just takes the control out of your hands. That that's the main thing for me. Yeah, but yeah, interesting. That's not a way that I've ever heard it described. I mean, when other people say what it means, it just talks about yeah, just the power. 
yeah. and just, I, I hadn't even thought about like basically it taking the, the paddle out of your own hands and making you a an npc in the uh <laughs> in the in the game that, at hand. That, that is pretty much what it is if you take it to an extreme now of course it's going to be on a lesser scale than that because it's not a tennis racket but it is some version of that more yeah. than what you are currently doing and then you kind of have the obvious issues which i think we've all touched on before which is first just danger um i think people are wearing eyeglasses more and more uh, and there's definitely a reason for that and that trampoline effect is more dangerous than a non trampoline effect right um and and once again if you want to talk about increasing paddle technology i think we can have that i think it's theoretical that we should increase it maybe it'll make the game more fun in that case i'm probably wearing safety glasses but it might make it more fun <laughs> Um, I think racquetball actually had that issue. I could be wrong. I don't know a ton about racquetball, but I think they started to use technology that was hitting the ball harder. Um, and I do think that was a little bit responsible for maybe the points not being as long. Somebody that's mm -hmm. in racquetball, like Daniel De, De La Rosa may be able to tell me, um, if I'm correct about that. Uh, but I do think you want to be careful with technology being too good. Like for instance, back to baseball, I love the baseball example. They went to wooden bats at some point, right? Cause they're like, these are too good. People are getting hurt and it's too easy. Right. Maybe baseball now needs to go back to something more powerful because it's a pitcher's war now. So, you know, there's always that balance of what do you think is most entertaining and what's best for for professionals. Uh, and that that's all subjective. But I think it's certainly worth a conversation of what that point is. And again, here I like to take analogies. Women's doubles. I'd say a lot of people think women's doubles is more entertaining than men's doubles. I don't disagree with you. Do you know why that is? Because they don't have they don't have as much power to put the ball away generally, or they don't or they stand a couple of feet off the kitchen line and they have extended hands battles. Yeah. So it's which not I think about is the most the... fun port exactly. Part Everyone ball, loves right? hands battles. It's not the initial attack; it's the counters. So guys mm -hmm. have harder counters, and that's what ends the point. That's why we don't attack as much. That's why we don't have hands battles as much. So picture that we reduce the men's paddles, for instance, to make us theoretically exactly equivalent on average to the women's game it would adapt to look very similar. We'd have a lot more hands battles. If we were all using wooden paddles, we'd have hands battles all the time, right? But if we go to the reverse spectrum of that, if we all use tennis rackets, you will have none of those, mm -hmm. right? And that, that's really my argument for increasing the power too much. But then on the flip side of that, you say, but you can do cooler stuff with the ball. You can hit it harder. That looks really cool. And I don't disagree with you. There is something there. Uh, you don't want a wooden paddle. You don't want a tennis racket. It's somewhere in the middle, right? Yeah. My take is generally like I think that you can incentivize speed ups, which is what we all want. Nobody wants to watch long dink rallies except for you and that one guy from Daytona. I think you guys were. We had fun. That. We had, Nobody else we had was. a lot of fun. Uh, Kyle <laughs> Kazuda and Craig Johnson. Yeah. I mean Colin and Kyle might have well just had a tea party. <laughs> like you guys were just going at it. It was a little, I, little drill sesh. <laughs> <laughs> um I think that the spin really allows for for speed ups. Mm -hmm. And I do think that it, we want a way of having those drawn out um, firefights. Yeah, right? it's two variables to mess with, right? Spin versus power. What if you reduce power but increase spin? Then you can speed up more without as much repercussion. Right, and, uh, and then the counters are worse. That might be a better play. Maybe the spin needs to go up and the power needs to come down. Uh, or you could do the reverse way. I don't, I don't think you want to be playing with uh, super slick, really powerful things. So I tend more towards the other one. But there's, there's some balance of those two variables for sure. Mm. Yeah. I like to see the experimentation. That's all I like. Yeah, I, I don't love know it. whether anything I say is correct or not, but I want to see it. <laughs> we should experiment test it. Yeah, I, and I think uh, you know the, the pros would have a definitely a better idea if you had better tests uh, to where they're like, okay, this is a great test. We have something that is consistent. It's reliable. We understand what it is. Uh, then you can kind of start to mess with things. Right now, it's all just like, ooh, what's this? We don't know what deflection is. We don't know what well, it's like. It's, it's super hazy, right? Um, but I think pros would be very amenable to testing different stuff uh, if you have very dependable rules. So maybe, you know, you start out with uh, that, what I said before, that the Selker Go 2 is the new maximum. And then we're like, hey, let's bump it up by 10%. That's our new maximum. Let's try that for this a while. episode sponsored by Selkirk. <laughs> <laughs> Theoretical, guys. <laughs> um, interesting. Um, so have you had a chance to, to see the, the U.S. Open's new um, That was hilarious. Change? Yeah. Yeah, you like that? <laughs> yeah, that is I thought funny. they were just late on April Fool's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is uh, very interesting. I, I don't think they've ever really known what to do about paddles, and because they're independent from USA Pickleball or the PPA, they probably don't have much of a um, perspective on how to run that part appropriately. They're just, uh, I don't know, let's – throw some rules out there and see if they stick. And 
that probably wasn't well done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for those that uh, that aren't uh, aren't aware of what we're we're talking about, um, Frank Anthony Davis tweeted yesterday a, a policy that apparently came from from the U.S. Open. Yep. Um, that <clears throat> said essentially you can challenge a paddle at the U.S. Open, and if I challenge Ben's paddle, they're going to send it to the national testing, and if it's found to be out of specification in any way. Ben forfeits all of his yep. prize money points. <laughs> uh, I, I guess the points are irrelevant at this point. Prize money, medals, whatever, and serves a year suspension. He can't play the next U.S. Open. Right. And I'm, um, yeah. However, if I test Ben's paddle and Ben's paddle is good, I forfeit all of my money that I earned with a regular legal paddle yep. and also get suspended for the next yeah. year. It's funny. What? (laughs) If a player can test someone else's paddle, the paddle is sent out for testing and is found to be within legal specifications, then the player contesting the paddle will be subject to forfeiting any medals, prize money, and receiving a one-year suspension from attending the next U.S. Open. Pretty drastic. Interesting. So what I think they need to do is they need to say get somebody that's going to be the sacrificial lamb and just be an ass. (laughs) Challenge challenge everybody. Every paddle. (laughs) They're like, all right, that's I'm, okay, I'm not going to play thought. next year. I'm not going to play next year anyway. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to challenge yours, yours. Everybody gets a paddle I, I think challenge. they'd immediately amend and just be like, max three or something <laughs> like that. Just immediate amendments. I mean, the U.S. Open, they they uh, definitely don't have a, anything against making rules on the fly, I don't think. They're mm-hmm. just like, oh, well, we don't want to deal with this, so let's make a rule against it. <laughs> are, are both of you playing in the U.S. Open this year? No. Neither? No, we're not. Neither of you. Yeah. So there's been uh, – pretty good number of of top pros that are not going to be participating this year yeah so basically what happened i'm not sure if you had transferred to the ppa i think you had by the time they had this conversation i'm not sure whether everyone was asked or what the collective group was but i know the ppa in at least one of the pro group chat threads with like 20 pros they're like hey can we get your take on do you like the us open do you want to play da, 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 da. because whatever we do whether we let, let players play or not it needs to be consistent across the board we're not right. just to be like play and half you do half you don't and the majority said we don't really care about it that much there's no appearance fee unless you can get us a good appearance fee there we don't want to play hmm. uh pko's like okay then we're not doing it yeah which but i understand it like across the board it needs to be consistent right So there was that. And from my perspective, I think a lot of pros, at least last year, were not super high on the U.S. Open. I mean, I think we paid down to third or fourth ish, which is not good. No appearance fees. And then, I mean, the venue, some people have issues with humidity and community parks. Yeah. Interesting. So no, no, uh, you don't feel like the U.S. Open has this legacy and not playing it is in some way or another detrimental. You're just kind of indifferent on it. I mean, I would like it to have a legacy, but ultimately it is mostly the name. And if that name could carry on and have a legacy, that would be great. Right. It is. But I mean, there, the there is some standard. Once again, you take extremes. Yeah. If it was just your, let's say it was no prize money, mm-hmm. say you didn't pay at all, are people still going to play? Mm-hmm. Obviously not. So along with prize money, there's other factors that make a tournament quality. And I don't think it had matched the other tournaments of modern day pickleball right. basically right. and a tournament can be high quality in some ways versus another right mm-hmm. i think that the us open is probably the the biggest and best event for amateurs Absolutely, right but they yeah. didn't carry over the same attention to the <clears throat> yeah to the pros and i think that's fine that's that's up to them right they, they offer an amazing amateur experience so good for amateurs they have a they have a great tournament it's just if it's not a pro tournament i mean it is what it is right it's their prerogative yeah yeah, yeah. All right, Tommy, what's next? Um, I mean, we could go a number Just of different ways. feed me more ways questions here. on mechanical <laughs> testing and rules. That's, that's, all, uh, that's all I love talking about. Well, so about. what do you, I mean, it, it, in the interim. You can, you can go on the other podcast for that one, the one <laughs> with the, like those, those uh, that 3-5 and mini-me. Uh, the people that talk about paddles a lot? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I've seen that on YouTube. <laughs> Probably uh, not. All right. In the in the interim, though, because we don't have a solution for this testing, like, what do you think should be done? I mean, the U.S. Open is obviously taking the most so drastic. Are you approach. talking about interim in terms of say we're deflection testing now, for delamination get... specifically? Okay, yeah. So if you're talking delamination specifically, you should have you should just use something that's ultrasonic based, which ultrasonic is able to test whether the surface is still in contact with the core. 
um, USA Pickleball was was trying out that, and that would be the quickest way I know of that would you could actually you know keep it portable um, and bring it to to tournaments. And that's unlike the deflection test, it would not read paddles that have been used as failing that aren't delaminated. Mm-hmm. Whereas deflection will do that sometimes. And of course, when something delaminates, it is going to test higher on a deflection test, like higher out of range than uh, than a used paddle that's not. But the used paddle can still fail from time to time, and that's kind of why you don't want to do it on used paddles. Um, and you don't really want to get stuck into the numbers game of, oh, was it 50% over? Was it 30% over? What's delaminated? What's not? Like, it's just not a concrete thing at all because it's right. just numbers. Yeah. Um, but ultrasonic would probably be the best in the short term. And then I think you, as quickly as possible, need to get to a velocity-based test, which is pure power, and that really can't be beaten other than um, – there, there is one scenario where it could be, but that wouldn't be too much of an issue. Okay. We're bringing the ultrasound to, to pickleball. You heard the ultrasound. Oh, <laughs> have you, have you been talking to, to Carl from USA? Yeah. Pickleball? So when, when he's at events, he'll, he'll kind of show me what they've been up to. Cause they're, they're trying to work on this problem actively. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's done a ton for USA pickleball. He's kind of the guy that is most about, you know, the rules and testing and getting it done. And he's very enthusiastic about it, which is great to have somebody like that. We're thankful for people that are, you know, doing rules and doing good work like that. Um, so yeah, we, we talked about deflection one time. He's just like, you know, it's, it's not good for used paddles in general. So we kind of need to get away from that in some sense. So then he brought the ultrasonic to one and he kind of showed me how that worked. I I think he took a video of me and a a couple other pros kind of spectating how that works. Um, and that was just something he was looking at because of the delamination issue. And it really doesn't look for anything other than delamination. So Mm -hmm. I was like, you realize that if you just use this, people are going to find other ways to get around the rules. And he's like, yes. So we need to also do other stuff. <laughs> but um, it could, it could hold them back for yeah. six months. Te- temporary, uh, temporary out. fix until you, you transition. Gotcha. Yeah. I've, I've, I talk to Carl relatively frequently at some of these tournaments when mm-hmm. my paddles are getting tested by rough. Um, um, and, uh, yeah, we've had some of those. Mm-hmm. Have <laughs> you seen, uh, any of the optical topography stuff he's done? That's interesting. Mm-hmm. That's, That's nice. Yeah. Super interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of techniques you can use to, to look at the, the surface very in-depth and is a lot more accurate than just the mechanical stylus going over the surface, which, which would be great to have. Um, so I think upgrading in that sense would be really nice as well. Yeah, for those of, of you who, who don't know what we're, we're talking about, I think I mentioned it Me? on a previous episode, but basically something that USA Pickleball is messing around with for measuring – it would need to be a different measurement. It's not going to be RZ or, or RT. There'd be a different way of, of... That's just average peak to valley of a stylus moving over peaks to valleys, basically. Uh, optical will use... Generally, you can do it a couple of different ways. You can use white light. You can use lasers. But it just fires it into a surface on, on a bunch of different areas and uh, creates an image based on typically a light system yeah it, it looks like the the output of which looks like a topographical map where you can yeah. see when you have some of these raw carbon uh paddles mm-hmm. there's tiny little ridges and and valleys that mm-hmm. the current system doesn't pick up on or read effectively yeah. this system so again you need like, like a new standard would. right you're actually trying right. to transition He's to a saying, new standard yeah he, he you can't use rz and rt i don't mm-hmm. really exactly know what those things are <laughs> but um you can't use those on this new form of testing and right. carl's basically looking into like what is the best way of of measuring and what is our our number for whatever measurement mm-hmm. we we come up with with this new yeah. test and, and i think what's important to see about that is Although it, what we have right now is not a perfect system, it's better than the power system we have, which it doesn't do a perfect job, but it eliminates the anything rampant, right? There's not anything. I don't think any pros have really been complaining a lot about like, oh, that's too spinny. It's like, yeah, yeah I mean, you just send it to the test. The, the test isn't perfect. So yeah, you, you can probably get by a give or take, you know, five out of the, the 40 limit, micron limit. Um, just because the test isn't perfect, but that's a lot better than, oh, our test is horrible and it can go up to a hundred percent more, right? It's a lot more than nothing. And that's more the idea. I think it's interesting because I I generally thought that the spin issue from last year more affected the singles players than doubles players. A hundred percent did. And then the, the power issue, at least in the men's game, more affects the doubles players than the singles player. Yeah. And also the women's singles players. Yes. Um, whereas spin didn't really affect the women's singles players as much. Yeah, I feel like with spin and singles, the most important thing is your window that you could hit above the net, a ground stroke and keep in, dramatically increased. So, I mean, if you have 50% more spin, say you can hit it four, four and a half feet over the net instead of three, that's 
enormous, right? Yeah, and, um, and the thing with with that is like a delaminated paddle doesn't really help me against you. You can cover sideline to sideline unless I get this ball to dip away from you. Correct. That's why people kick their penalties down low on goalies, mm -hmm. right? If goalies are jumping outwards, just straight outwards, they can reach farther. But if they go have to go outwards and down, Diagonal. then there's a little bit of a window there. Yeah. And then there's also just the dipping part of it. It's not really the speed that makes other players make errors. Generally, on in singles, it is the dip. The dipping really making, makes a huge making difference. Making your opponent hit upwards I remember a little you, bit. So, sometimes in that, era, in that era, I'm going to call it an error now, <laughs> you'd hit drives that would start you know, over that, like a typical drive. And by the time it got to me, I'd be hitting it from my knees at the kitchen line. I was like, this doesn't feel right. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the, the the power issue I think definitely helps the women because on their ground strokes they can just power through it so much more. Like on a return, for instance, which I'd say is the hardest ground stroke to put power on, mm -hmm. they're hitting like these deep, nice returns. Now I was like, ooh, that's that's different. Mm -hmm. So yeah, very very helpful there. But then in doubles, of course, it just makes it scary to attack anybody. Right, you don't know what's coming back. Mm -hmm. It's like the psycho guy in prison. <laughs> you just don't want to mess with them. Don't don't even try it. Don't risk it. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about, right? Well, I think you got to make a statement. You got to go for the jugular of the crazy guy. <laughs> that sounds like Tim Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, perfect segue. You want to tell us about Tim Nelson? Sure. <laughs> Tim Nelson, the puppet master, was actually even a little bit before my time. He he stopped playing in, I think, 2015, and I started playing in uh, 2016 and 2017. Uh, but what, why I mentioned that is sometimes he would set the tone. So in terms of like sometimes basketball players, they might foul you on the first one, just be like, I'm going to be all up in your, in your grill this whole game. Uh, he would just go for a face shot first ball sometimes, or at least <laughs> that's, that's what Kyle told me. He's like, yeah, you got to know about this guy, the puppet master. Yeah. There were, there were some legendary stories about the guy. Uh, he invented the nasty Nelson. Um, and he was one of the play best players, uh, up to, up to 2015. So yeah, the, the puppet master is quite a guy. Yeah, he is Nelson. He's the Nelson we're all talking about. Yeah. 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 Um, we'll have to have Brian Ashworth on the show. He at knows some, point. some some real OG stories. I've heard some good stories. <laughs> I, you know, he was a little bit before my time as well. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there's there's plenty. That guy's a that guy's a, a, a riot. He, if if only he was playing, we would have so much more Infamous. podcast material. Infamous. <laughs> Special. Who are, who are some of like the other uh, pickleball OGs that you looked up to when you first got into the game? Uh, some pickleball Maybe OGs. that people don't, you know, people yeah, aren't so familiar actually with. Callan Dawson has been playing a lot, much longer than you think. Um, he, he was, I think I saw him play with his dad in like 2015 Nationals, mm -hmm. so he was definitely playing before me. Kyle was the biggest one. He was, uh, you know, 2016 down to like 2012-ish, uh, so 2012 onwards. Uh, Puppet Master, who else was there? Uh, Zane Affleck was was really good. Um, I'm not sure how much before my time he was. He was during my time for sure. 2016 mm -hmm. through like 2019, he played a lot. Uh, he was very good. Uh, Bubba Zabindin. Uh, oh yeah, Randy. Yeah, so he was cut. He's kind of cut from the same cloth as as Tim a little yeah, bit. Like so he's he, not afraid he was, to throw one at was your the, face. The generation right before Kyle, I think I, I'd classify like Bubba, Chris Miller, Brian, Tim is all like almost like the Seattle crew. And then like Kyle came in and he was one generation. I was like a generation after Kyle. That's how I think of it at least. Uh, Bubba, you can actually see Bubba's influence in today's game. So the biggest thing he imparted on the game was he would run around his backhand at the kitchen line and hit that inside out forehand, like mm -hmm. the, the clean dink winner that we all love to hit. Like mm -hmm. even DJ hits it uh, now. And, I don't know, maybe DJ DJ just did that naturally, but you can see so many uh, influences in a lot of players. So like Kyle got it from Bubba, Tim got it from Bubba, or maybe Bubba got it from Tim, I don't know that. I got it from Kyle. Uh, Wesley Gabrielson, that's another OG, he got it from Kyle. And then you could see influence in, in other players that maybe they got it from Kyle or maybe they got it from me, like it just passes on and on and on. You can be like, yeah, I think Bubba was the original guy that did that. <laughs> uh, Chris Miller. Huge OG. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's still around. Um, but yeah, he's been playing longer than anybody I know, like over 30 years, I think. Oh, shit. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He used to like teach it in, in gym class. Uh, so yeah, he was playing back in the Steve Peronto days. Damn. I, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Yep. Original Seattle guy. And here I thought he was just some old pervert. <laughs> 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 oh, boy. Wes Gabrielson's still floating around. Yeah. Yeah. He was uh, coaching the ATX. Um, MLP team, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so he won 2016 Nationals, uh, TOC. Uh, he was made some finals in 2017. I, I got the experience to play with him a couple times. Awesome, awesome guy. Yeah. 
even I got to play against him. <laughs> I just didn't realize he was uh, he was an OG at the time. Yeah, he, he is one of the people that will make new tennis players in pickleball look the most silly. Okay, because he's got a whole bag of tricks because he's been playing so long. It's just oh, like yeah, lefty, right, right. heavy slice. He'll go to the right hand sometimes. He'll misdirect yeah. stuff randomly. He'll lob you. It's just like, what is going on? Yeah. <laughs> like, I yeah, did not that, sign up for this. That misdirect where he's he's he'll knife like three backhand slices in a row, and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden he'll swing with his backhand, but he's got his paddle in his right hand mm -hmm. and hit it. Behind oh, so you. nasty! You might as well pull so your shorts down hands. after that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he's actually he will serve right. I've seen play you lefty. do this. Yeah, yeah, I got it from from him uh, and and Joey Farias a little bit. Yeah, uh, but he was one of the first I saw do that. So he's righty and lefty. He'll hit like overheads righty. He throws a baseball okay. righty and then plays lefty. So if I were to like match new tennis players that just came to pick a ball against some players where I just want them to look silly, I'd choose like either Wesley and Kyle or Wesley and DJ. Like, there's just a couple players. There's yeah, so much funk to their game. It's just like. Give him, we give don't know him what's Callen. going on. Give huh? him Callen. Callen would be good. It's just he plays like he just puts the ball in front of you, and tennis players would be like, "I think I can beat him," and of course they never do. Right. They just wouldn't. They wouldn't respect him. Exactly. <laughs> yes, they wouldn't respect him at all. Same thing with like Cassidy. Cassidy just you're like, "What is this guy doing?" But I'm getting right, just right, right. crushed right now. Like I can't get it through him at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's definitely I think a couple they'd have players. Fits with a with a Dylan Fraser pump fake too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the pump fake, the the little flick through the middle. Like Dylan is probably the the highest level player that also has a ton of funk to his game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, um, he he's one of the few players who is like pure pickleball through pure pickleball through. yeah um and i think he's a good example of what pure pickleball can look like because i think he's been playing a, a good while um yeah. you know he did really well in the past three-ish years but I, I i could be wrong but i think he's playing for probably at least five ish mm -hmm. i think he's been yeah he's been playing for he was a midwest guy and i remember seeing him at a tournament back in like 2017 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, no, he's yeah. definitely longer than. And I think he'd been playing for like a couple years at that okay. point. Yeah, maybe. So I maybe bet you he probably started or... around the same time that that I did. I started okay. in 2013. Now I didn't really play very much at all until probably like 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. But and Dylan has been around that that whole time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. MTE is a rapidly growing two ounce supplement and drink that supports peak performance and feeling good the right way by replacing excessive caffeine with proven adaptogen and nootropics that provides all the energy and focus benefits of excessive caffeine, but without any of the pitfalls like jitters and insomnia. The formula also supports a calm mood, stress response, inflammation response, immunity, and better sleep at night. Go to getmte.com, G-E-T-M-T-E.com. Use the code the Dink 15 that's all caps the Dink 15 and that'll give you guys 15% off your first order that's code the Dink 15 at getmte.com so what does that's that's an interesting thing like what does the a top pickleball singles and doubles player look like 10 years from now oh, that is anyone's guess um Gosh, I would really like to know this because there's just so many factors, right? Like you have all these tennis players and it's not that tennis isn't the best sport for transition, but I can't say I know that for sure because we don't have enough sample size to say really high level table tennis players and kind of what they can contribute or like a combination of table tennis and tennis or badminton or whatever. Um, obviously, I think singles, it's hard to, to argue that tennis is not the best background. And I think mm -hmm. mostly it'll just look like longer guys that can cover the net better i mean when you got like a six six wingspan it is tough to pass anybody mm -hmm. or even drop on them so i think there's that and then they can as long as they have good movement side to side like a like a fun. daniel medvedev type of guy oh, like just it's gotta be just filthy like right. it'd be crazy like it's, it's quick and long yeah, i mean you can you can say quickness is great but pure length on a court that size net coverage it's hard to beat like yeah. quick doesn't matter when you get past <laughs> exactly right? so somebody like frank anthony davis is unbelievably fast mm -hmm. but it only matters at the baseline exactly it matters from the baseline or if and, you're playing and to, to a lesser extent than it does from the net as well like mm -hmm. he might be able to track some crazy stuff down but like but with straight one up passes lunge, lunging is is not you're not, not nobody nobody that i've ever seen is quick enough to just pat, to to go get their feet in position for a passing shot. Just right? doesn't, it doesn't. No matter how fast mm -hmm. you are, you can't be quick enough 
uh, as quick as somebody's reach, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So I think I think that is the more obvious answer for for singles. Just long, good tennis movement, good tennis strokes. Uh, you're still gonna have some cat and mouse, I think, uh, which will make the game look cool. But it'll be definitely, I think, more aggressive and less grinding up there. Just more like you know, flicking more almost clean winners off of a lot of balls at the line. More of a setup shot. Uh, doubles is more the mystery to me. I'd be like, well, tennis background's great, but I think they're gonna have to definitely add a lot of things like we see in the, today's game plus more things um i feel like my thing is we're gonna see more grip changes um not grip changes period but more like okay i use this grip for this position i'm um, hitting you know drives like this i'm hitting attacks like this i'm hitting counters like this you're gonna see a lot of this we're stuff hitting tomahawks like this yeah you're, you're gonna see tomahawks <laughs> you're gonna see coverage of anything that comes upwards at you with like you know a pancake and and uh, whatever you want to call this one uh, Scorpion, there's just going to be a lot of different ways to cover because I think people are realizing more and more in contrast like tennis where, you know, you're traditional, you're here, backhand, forehand. It's like when the court in doubles is only 10 feet wide, coverage is a little different than you might expect, especially when the down to up comes. So I think a, a good example is like Riley. Riley's so good at covering the, Sorry, the, the down to up meaning like a low ball being attacked, attacked upwards, upwards towards, towards you. Right? right. So he, for instance, when the ball is low, he's on forehand. When the ball is down, he's on backhand. What's what's funny is they're almost like reverse of each other. This only goes down. This only goes up. So he's almost doing the reverse of what he's seeing on the other side. So that is less about left and right and more about up and down. And of course, it's not that simple. There is times where he's still going to hit a backhand even if it's uh, coming upwards. But it's it's interesting to think about how that dynamic changes from what you'd con- uh, traditionally consider anything tennis-like form-wise. So tangent, but do you think that Riley would be a better pickleball player today if he had a more traditional game. Because I, I look at him, and he has unbelievably fast hands, and I don't know whether it's because of his grip or because of his natural ability. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that limits him is his inability to really speed up super effectively off the ground mm-hmm. on his forehand side. And the reach with your two-handed backhand is not nearly as good as reaching in with a with a one hand. Sure, yeah. So that, that's definitely hard to answer because of how players respond to it, right? I think Riley is a, a fairly unique game style that players struggle to play against. Now, if you saw a bunch of players that played like him, maybe people mm-hmm. would adapt to it more. Uh, short answer: I think he is better as a player overall if he's like he is and adds other stuff. Whereas it's harder to play more traditionally and add what he has. Right. I would right. take the more unique, intrinsic thing. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I've wondered about that. It's, it's right? an interesting question, like, for sure. If I you're just, coaching somebody, how do you coach them? You're like, all right, start off like Riley, then add these shots, and then you know get a little bit of this player. It's like, what is your perfect creation, right? If you can take a little bit of whatever you want. Sure. So, like, does he, does he, talking about your grip changes, right? Like, does he change his grip for a forehand speed up, or, or should he think about changing his grip for a sport forehand speed up? Should he think about adding a taking a, a one hand? I, th- I think. Every player can consider changing some stuff, whether it's grip or shots or otherwise, where it doesn't feel natural to add. But hey, you have the time to add it, so why not add some new tricks? Um, and those changes may be more dramatic than we think in the future once people figure out a little more fundamentally what pickleball is about and what benefits you the best. Yeah, it'll be interesting to to see. But I think there's, I, I have a hard time believing that anything is better than tennis for for ground strokes. Yep. But I have a hard time believing that tennis is the best for net play. In fact, I would be almost certain that it's that it's not right. It's some combination no. of, of I think tennis, badminton, and table tennis. Right, for where sure. you can learn a little bit from everything. Like there's, there's no an enormous blend. Yeah, there's no there's been no elite badminton player really take this seriously except for henry winardo mm-hmm. and henry winardo is a guy that can make people look so dumb oh, it was when crazy. he sets up for a, a backhand Remember his like backhand, this you'd be flinching before he even hit it and then sometimes <laughs> it would be a drop shot this far over the net and then other times it would be at your chest and then it'd be a lob i was like i don't know what's happening yeah, well, this- i hope to god this guy never becomes seriously good <laughs> off the bounce because anything out of the air he was deadly right just deadly so basically this this guy was a, a really really high level top five singles player in and the world. he could hold his paddle right here mm-hmm. and you're like oh okay he's gonna dink it 
and then you just get murdered with the ball. <laughs> just you can snap. snap his wrist from here to here, <laughs> right. two inch Incredible snap. Incredible velocity. Yeah. And hit the ball harder than I can with a full swing. Yeah. Right. Like, it, it's almost like the tomahawk phenomenon where, you know, you can do your wrist like this a lot faster than you can like this. <clears throat> Henry could move his backhand faster like this than I could do a forehand like this. It was just shocking. And when you're used to seeing backhands being a ding from that position, and suddenly it's at your chest, it was trippy. <laughs> hmm. Um,. Yeah, so there's there's something there. I think I think a lot of the movement patterns from table tennis actually resemble are, are closer to at the line. Yeah, at the yeah, line, a lot of shuffling, um, a lot mm -hmm. of moving around one uh, backhand or forehand. Uh, definitely a little different than tennis movement there. Yeah. I agree with you. That'll be interesting to see. What, what are you going to look like in 2033? 2033. I don't think I'll be playing pickleball anymore. I might still be watching it, but no. You're gonna, <laughs> you, what are you going to be? You're going to be in 2033. You're going to be 32, 33, uh, 34. 34. Yeah. Um, honestly, I, I, I don't there. think, and this is, it's hard. I don't really plan for the future that far ahead, but I don't think I'll be playing pickleball after 30. Yeah. Uh, really? Just, Why? I, okay, wait. Why do you say that? Because I like unique experiences. I like doing different things. And as fun as pickleball is, as fun as it is to be a professional athlete, you are doing a lot of the same thing. Okay. And doing that for six more years seems like a good amount of time doing it after that like i don't know when exactly i'm gonna be like all right i've had enough of this but i think there are bigger and better things out in the world sure like what what are you gonna go do we're gonna uh, go play John's paddle go tennis you never know I, I mean yeah I, we're going to play padel uh soon that, that'll be fun um but you know i i really like business i like people um i like managing companies or i, I like talking about rules and mechanical testing and i like yeah. I, I just have a ton of interests where i, I could be doing right. any number of things um and those those things could definitely interest me more than pickleball mm. after I've played pickleball for, say, 10 years. Like, I've been playing this since I was 17. Okay. Yeah, when I get to 27, that'll be a decade. I'll yeah. Like, do you want to spend your entire life doing it? Obviously not. So when does that stop? All know. right, so will that be good for the game or bad for the game that, you know, the pickleball's goat decides, you know what? <laughs> I'm burnt out. I want to go do something else. I think else. it's a very liberal application of the word goat because you'll have a new goat in – Okay, not, not the, that many years. Do the humble, <laughs> do the humble thing, and then you know answer the question. <laughs> um, I don't think it'll affect the game that that uh, here, one here, way or the other. Here's here's why I ask because I think some people's criticism right now is like you're just going to win everything <laughs> when you're in the draw. You win. Same thing with Anna Lee. That tends to be repetitive and boring. So I guess the question kind of boils down to: Are you are you good for the game of pickleball right now? Um, you bad for the game of pickleball? Good, good question. I, I think it's just you have, you're playing pickleball with a super small sample size of, of players. You know, the number of pros that are, you know, seriously doing this full time might be, you know, 50 on each side, if mm -hmm. that. Like, it's so small. Um, and anytime you saturate a sport more with a bigger sample size, it's going to be harder and harder for anybody to dominate. So uh, naturally, that will decline whether it's good for the game or not to have that. I think it's good now. It, it presents like a, a challenge and it's something interesting to follow. I think a lot of people want to see uh, me lose or Anna Lee <laughs> lose and, and that's fine. I think that that's great. It creates some, some story. Not necessarily line. that, but just other people win. For sure. Yeah. Um, and I think that'll just naturally happen more and more as you get more players. Um, yeah. And I think that's the natural evolution of a sport. I think it was easier for Babe Ruth to be the you know, the best when it was baseball and whatever 1920s or when did Babe Ruth play anybody? No, know? no, dude. I think that's accurate. <laughs> that's I'll accurate. say 1920s. Um, but yeah, it, you know, you have your, your Babe Ruth still that everyone was just like, Babe Ruth was amazing, but it's like, yeah, smaller sample size is easier to be better. Um, natural evolution. That's it. And I think games get more competitive over time, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you look at something like, like tennis, there's your example of like, okay, Nadal is probably going to win the French, but not always, right? Mm -hmm. I would say that you're about as dominant <clears throat> as Nadal is on clay. Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. So like, I think so his percentage is better than mine. <laughs> but like, what do you, what's your percentage chance of winning a given event? It's probably me versus the field. Yeah. In, in any given one right now, um, 70 to 80. Okay, so Nadal's what he he was like eleven for fourteen on French Opens, something like that. Yeah. So I mean, that's that's about Nadal on clay level. Let's go, but, Rafa. Uh, <laughs> I'm just Rafa, except my sample size is a thousand times smaller. <laughs> Let's go, big fish well, in a small I don't pond. Know. Your sample size can be larger because you've got a lot more tournaments under your belt, and Rafa's got fourteen French Opens or whatever the hell it is. Yeah, I don't Rafa, know. I'm better but, than you. I've said it. There we go. Get him out. Well, we're gonna get, dude. We gotta get Rafa on the pod. Oh, ben Johnson. That'll be easy. I mean, I'll just text him. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get him. Um, but 
I totally forgot where I was going to go with that. <laughs> I know where I was going to go. So you kind of, you did the humble thing. I don't know if I'm the goat, but like, I think pretty objectively at this point, you would be considered the greatest of all time. Currently. Give me, give me a counter argument. Uh, you're just my, saying my only in the future, anything could change. Is, yeah. It changes very quickly yeah. because you're at such a infancy of, of any sport. I just think that the, the term is not just in pickleball, but it's liberally a, applied in, right. in so many scenarios. But it's somebody like has to be comical. the GOAT regardless of I how much time there has been. Up to this point, and I just I think that pickleball will change rapidly enough to where 10 years down the road, somebody should, uh, theoretically should, um, you know, become the new – Goat. yeah yeah <laughs> um although i will say you know it's harder to to pass somebody like babe ruth mm -hmm. so many mlb or baseball references in this, this episode i don't know why but it's harder to pass babe ruth because he was so dominant in a time where it was easier to be dominant that's yeah. what makes um sports that are very evolved where players are dominant much more impressive to me so djokovic yeah. nadal Federer, them being as dominant as they were and i'd say djokovic in particular because Federer did dominate before those two really came in for a, a bit uh, Djokovic is the most dominant along with Nadal in an era where you had a ton of good players. So that like, I have a ton of respect for, for that or Michael Jordan, when you had an era where it was just so many good basketball players and he was still clearly the best. Mm -hmm. That's, what's very impressive to me. Mm -hmm. Now that we don't have good players now, it's just, we have a lot less of them, much smaller sample size. It's not yeah. saturated. Um, okay. Your brother, Colin, how good is he? Does he get does he get enough credit? Does he get props? Uh, I, I think he he gets them and he doesn't just because, you know, we, we definitely from the beginning kind of built him in a sense uh, to complement each other in, in a doubles game. Yeah. Um, so you are going to be extremely good at that role and he probably does get enough credit for that role. They're just like, yeah, he plays his role with Ben amazingly uh, and he's not very good at other things. That would be that's fair because we didn't practice them. We were talking today. I practiced them this morning. Is like, how many times have we, you know, dinked on the left side cross court and worked on my technique? I was like, I don't know, twice. Yeah. <laughs> so like it, it just doesn't happen. So of course you're not going to be a great left side mixed doubles player when you never practice it. That's just how sure. it works. Um, so, I mean, I, I'd really just say I'm more grateful to him that he was willing to be, I'm not going to be the best player I can be. I'm going to be the best player that I can be with you. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's that, that you got to respect that a lot. Right. Right. We're going to make the best team possible. That's right. Yeah. Well, is there a case to be made that that's kind of the, that's the answer? I mean, that, that should be the formula is players should play with each other and essentially if you want to be the nobody best else. doubles team you can, yeah. then in, in theory, yes, you should be building uh, each other, whether you build how me and Colin did or, or some other way, uh, building with each other is definitely going to be the best for you to each be the respective best player for each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On that note, all future best teams said it on Twitter. I'll say it again. They will be righty lefty. Righty lefty with no four hands in the middle. Yes. Do you think there's something to four hands out? <sighs> not, not really. Uh, I could be wrong, but I, I've never seen a scenario where that is that great. Um, but I, I definitely, actually, I can see it because picture an AJ Kohler playing right side. His back in the middle, nasty, just flip from anywhere, mm -hmm. right? His forehand, very lengthy on the outside. And he's great at the left side, but you can see how a player like that could be really nasty on the right side. My biggest thing is when I try to attack through the middle, nothing closes faster than a lefty on me. And I'm just like, gosh, that's so hard to beat. Uh, and we don't have, we have such a small sample size of lefties. We have like, what, three that are really good? And uh, you never see them top. on the We have like two in top side. 20, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, so I, I think just the the court coverage and such a small width of 20 feet of two forehands in the middle is just so obscene it's so tough yeah so the so you're looking at it defensively right like or covering shake and bake is a big up. one too for me it's yeah. it, like it is so difficult to play somebody that drives well with tyler lewing and tyler's crash i'm like i have to hit this really well yeah right? that, that there's so much more pressure of tyler crashing than a righty with his back end it's immense i guess what i would like to see is a lefty over there hitting bounce speed ups mm -hmm. like if you're dinking your backhand to a lefty forehand over there mm -hmm. like that could be an interesting opportunity to present something that other people don't see yeah so in yeah i like i like that view my only issue with it is i think you get limited whenever you talk about dinking and attacking off of dinks you are simply limited by the the court and the net and how hard you can hit things for instance your backhand off the bounce versus anyone's forehand it's not that far away. It's really, it's, it's close, right? So I will take the fundamental coverage of the court over the ability to hit 
forehands from the outside part of the court. True, but I think more people are, are generally more comfortable speeding up with the forehand than the backhand, right? That's uh, most true. of the right sided yes. players yeah. are comfortable speeding up with their forehand. But I do think it's easier to practice speed ups than you can get better coverage. True. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think, uh, I think it's interesting. I think it's worth experimentation. Like, I agree. It, everything's worth experimenting in pickleball because we don't know anything. But could, could you imagine, like, so two players on the right side that are that are playing really, really well and are and are just tough to play against from that side mm -hmm. are are Thomas and DJ. Thanks. Not you. Don't worry. Um, but Thomas, Thomas Wilson, because they both speed and up DJ, well off the forehand. They can speed up off the forehand, or they can really roll that dink really aggressively. Yes, the roll dinks is an interesting thing for me because, right, you like rolling a forehand to a backhand dink wise. It is dicey, right? It's the forehand will usually win that battle. So that's where you're like, I can see what what you're saying. Having forehands on the outside could be big. Um, it's it's really does that trade off with the coverage? Definitely worth experimenting because I, I can see that. Uh, we don't see many lefty flips from the left side right off right. the outside corner that, that would be, be like a the Riley strange Newman angle funk, that would right? be very strange i'd be like what's it'd be happening? something you don't you don't normally yeah. see mm -hmm. for sure yeah interesting more experiments more experiments at one time i considered how good could i get lefty should i just be a right side player as a lefty <laughs> <laughs> yeah because i had lefty coordination in tennis i was like well this backhand is so bad this will never be good can't do it forget it <laughs> um well, speaking of failed experiments, <laughs> <laughs> where, where are you going with this one? <laughs> Noah Rubin, <laughs> yeah, Ooh, tough. announced That's his tough uh, his his pickleball retirement and announced it in the weirdest way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he was like, "Okay, here's why. Here's my excuse. Here's why I think I'm better than all these people." And also, before I leave, here's why pickleball sucks right now and what it needs to do to improve. Interesting. Are you? Gonna I mean, that's him? basically what he said. Well, pickleball does have a lot to improve, so that's fair. He may have been correct. I don't actually know what he said. But what did, did you not watch the video? No. I mean, you you would just have to watch it. People but. are giving him him flack. I didn't think it was as bad as you're you're portraying it. Like he, he said, there there are things to there are things that that pickleball needs to work on. There are things that pickleball is copying from tennis that probably aren't admirable qualities of tennis. That's fair. Uh, yeah, Entirely I think there were some fair. fair fair takes and mm -hmm. you know i think there's maybe some things that he might have left out about his pickleball career <laughs> yeah. that were probably well that's my point it just seemed like this big but, excuse like him dancing around the fact that he's just not he's not there as a player i think that's all speculation i, I can't right I can't whether that's true or not well we're asking you to all. speculate speculate <laughs> i mean no, you, it, you it, is, it is tougher to get results quickly than you think i will say that Especially in doubles. Very much so. Yeah. Do you think the barrier to entry in doubles is is too high right now? No, not it's at all. It's too substantial no, if you're switching no, you can, into the sport? You can be a top 10 player within two years if you have. I mean, yeah. Ignatovich, two mm -hmm. years, done. Mm -hmm. I mean, his first tournament was probably a year ago. He's top 10. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a really low barrier, absurdly mm -hmm. low barrier. Mm-hmm. What, what qualities about James do you think led to him getting so good so quickly? Um, he's quick. He's long. Uh, has learned how to play aggressively. Um, I think he has a good, a very good two-handed backhand, which on the guy's side has been a development that definitely helps. Um, and I think he, he learned how to speed up and identify patterns with speed ups quickly, which is one of the barriers that a lot of people, that a lot of tennis players struggle with is the pattern recognition because it's not what you're used to. Uh, so he just, he adapted to the patterns very quickly, I think. And I think that it helped him that he tried to play as much as he possibly could with a lot of different players and tournaments. That's how you learn stuff quickly. And he did a great job of that. Gotcha. Yeah. I think that one of the things that struck me obviously was he's, he's long, he's, he's fast, but like ever since he started playing he got a volley that thing was a rocket ship mm -hmm. like he has easier power heavy than hands. anybody that i've that i've seen definitely mm -hmm. heavy hands yeah and i find it interesting that he will often sit one-handed backhand on counters to his body and then go to a two-hander when you get into more firefights which is i definitely think like one of the kind of adaptations we were talking about where that may be a play that you're going to see more and more often just because of how efficient it is like i don't think you get a ton of power here with a two-handed backhand with the mm -hmm. one he sticks it nicely with uh the high fading one over here he goes to the two and those are ideal scenarios where you want to be doing those things um and you also do like a severe continental grip on the, on the one-handed counter so it gets down uh, on the backhand and then that 
allows his forehand to be kind of like AJ, where he can cup it like a holster down here with yeah, the forehand. Yeah, he, he kind of catches so it back behind him a little bit. coverage is really important because of how he uses his grips plus his two-handed backhand. Hmm. Interesting. What do you got, Tommy? I don't know. You don't know? All right, well, the to- Thomas wrote a question on here that isn't my yeah, question. Yeah, ask my questions for me. Yeah, I will. I have, apparently, i got to do your job for you. Um, what's <laughs> You're up doing with a good job, a uh, slow the starter? <laughs> a slow starter? Yeah, I just I don't wake up early, naturally. I don't have a lot of energy early. Uh, I play slow, and I also have a thing about energy con- conservation. Um, Must be nice. <laughs> but I just, uh, especially even though I don't have a lot of energy early, when I'm playing a tournament day outside of a final... I know that I need to play other matches. I have many days ahead of me, and I will play slow on purpose and not move a lot because you have to conserve. And maybe the ideal athlete is able to just go full tilt the whole time. I'm not that. I wish I could, but I don't. Um, So, yeah, I definitely conserve sometimes. Slow starter other than that just takes me a while to to get a feel for everything. Like pickleball to me is very much uh, like a flow sport where I'm in the flow. I can feel where I need to be at what time. That's super important, and hitting my shots feels natural hesitation is really bad for me so it just takes me a while to get into that kind of groove basically so you think the slow starter criticism is is pretty fair I mean, you recognize no, that I mean, in yourself statistics like i yeah. i lose the first game like more than anybody <laughs> right 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 yeah <laughs> that's bad so how do you overcome that i mean do you think some of your losses could be attributed to the fact that you just didn't turn it on soon enough uh yeah for sure uh it's, it's entirely unhelpful to put yourself in a hole to begin mm-hmm. with um so <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I, I, I didn't do that quite as often um so i understand it's one of my flaws it's one of the things i work on I, i've been trying to do different kinds of warm-ups in terms of body and and uh, pickleball and all that to make myself start a little faster and yeah i think i've gotten a little better at it but still a long way to go on that sure sure uh all right so let's talk about the fact that you are so closely aligned uh, I would say with the the PPA, so the tour wars, if you will, mm-hmm. well, all the developments with the APP and PPA back and forth, yep. Major League Pickleball coming into play, and that being contentious at some at one point, mm-hmm. uh, Vibe Pickleball being introduced to this day, you've been so closely aligned with the PPA. You've always been like the PPA golden boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think first it's from the beginning. I definitely thought. The PPA, as far as the people behind it, their vision, that was what I thought was best for the future of pickleball. And Mm -hmm. I accepted from the get-go, I definitely could be wrong. And if I'm wrong, that's fine. I'll I'll accept that and I will move on and and try to do the best for pickleball that I can outside of that. Um, But definitely, just from the beginning, I kind of thought it was probably the move. And as it's continued, I've kind of continued to align with that. Um, But ultimately, I think what's best for all the pros collectively is also best for each individual pro. So really anything I've done with PPA as far as like, hey, we should do this, I've been kind of thinking, would this be best for pros? Will this better the pro game? Uh, So like some examples of that would be, initially, you might remember the days, we didn't always do single elim. We used to do double elimination in PPA. And although not to my advantage, I was like, hey, we should do single elimination. I think this is best for pros, they play a few less matches, which is better on their bodies. And I think it looks more professional. It's more like tennis. And that's a good aspect of tennis that we need to to put into play. And they're like, okay, let's do it. And I was like, this is going to be not good for me. I was a double dip specialist, but hey, (laughs) better for the pros. Let's do that. And I was like, hey, randomized seating. We need to shuffle seats three and four. We need to do five through eight, shuffle those. Um, And of course, they don't just do what I tell them. They ask other pros too. But other pros are like, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, Tennis-like. So there's a lot of scenarios where I wanted to push for things that were better for pros as a whole in the game because that is not only better for all the pros it's better for everyone individually as well it's just Mm -hmm. it makes sense um as for kind of tour wars and all that um i think the more people we have that are gung-ho about pickleball being great and expanding the better if there's competition competition among that great i think the the pickleball pro tour was bettered as a whole because there was competition sure No, no doubt um i'm glad the mlp and ppa came together and I think that their discourse throughout the, the whole time probably bettered both of them as well. So fine with that. And I think as long as we are moving forward with good things for pros overall, that's a great thing. Do you like playing Major League Pickleball? I do. So what I will say about Major League Pickleball is it is extraordinarily fun. I think you get this from everybody. I think that the players have an enormous amount of fun on a team. They 
get to like just playing on a team is, is always fun i think and i would say that i never spectate other matches as much as i did with major league pickleball right so for it, sure. it, it is extraordinarily fun what i will say We're, about just, it just just from pure like entertainment value like it's just fun to for watch the fans. yeah it's fun yeah, the, yeah, it's fun yeah. for yeah. other players to watch it's fun for fans to watch they engage a ton the players are having a ball um and all those things are are wonderful that's what you want you want engagement um and now on the flip side of that coin what i will say is do i enjoy mlp as much as as ppa events i love the change up but the period answer is no i don't enjoy it quite as much because to me pickleball for me personally is about striving to be the best you can be yeah now that means to me playing with my best partner against the two best partners across the court that right. is the highest level pickleball you can get i'm striving for the highest level i'm not striving just to have fun mm -hmm. love the change up i will go have fun at, at mlp and, and have a ball um which one would i take one or the other i will take you know normal events just because to me that is the highest level and in some sense in major league pickleball all this, this is what makes it fun with new matchups you are in some sense penalized for being a higher level player because mm -hmm. you are paired with lower level players mm -hmm. first pick by definition numbers wise you have the worst team after yourself and that's fine it makes for balanced teams it makes for entertainment but uh as a player i think that if you're not just out to have fun you are out to you know be the best player you can be the best team you can be that is not major league pickleball and they're just different things and there's there's great things about both uh, and i think we need both as a gm you're a gm you're looking at this externally, you remove yourself from the situation, but at the same time, there's there's a Ben Johns in the draft. Mm -hmm. Should you be the number one overall pick? Uh, I don't think we've had enough events to say what the correct strategy is exactly. If I were a GM right now, I would try to trade down my pick. I wouldn't be among the first probably four picks. I'd want to be middle of the pack. Yeah. I'd want to be very balanced that would change as the field becomes deeper. If I have a deeper field, if I have down to 24, especially on the women's side, if I have 24 that I'm like, these are all comparable, mm -hmm. then I want the first pick. Okay. Other than that, right now I want middle of the pack pick. If I was forced to have my, the number one pick here, um, I, right now I would draft myself, but it would be very tough to, to, to bypass Anna Lee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because our, the our only sample size is you guys finished what fourth? We in finished the first? semis slash fourth or third, and then, and then won the last first. one. Like, two is not a good sample size at all. It was like we and we had a couple fortunate things happen for us to win, and I don't think I was even necessarily the biggest factor uh, of us winning. So um, that's the nice it, part it was, about MLP. It was drafting a nice team that really got us there. Uh, I think the yeah. Megan and Etta in particular played really really well, and that's what made the difference for us. Um, so yeah, you just, you, it's hard to speculate when your sample size is so small. Right. Well, and it could be like, e, so let's just say hypothetically, Annalie could have been a correct first pick 100%. and then they didn't build the team correctly around her. For sure. Or you could have been a, an, an incorrect for a first pick, but you built a better <laughs> you team something funny? around you. Yeah. So during the draft, while, while the draft was happening, I saw Annalie get to through her third pick and I just went, oh my gosh. If she picks the right player on the last pick, everyone else is screwed. As random as MLP is with the rally scoring and all that, she can easily have the best pick. If she picks, you want to know who I told Colin? You can ask Colin. I, at the time of the draft, while the draft was happening, I was like, if she picks this person, everyone's going to lose. Was, that's, it a, that's was it a male? 48. Or, male or it was a male. 48? When oh. she drafted Hayden. Not, not that Hayden's bad, but there was a male out there. I was like, if she drafts this guy, they're going to be so good. Mm -hmm. And I've been proving correct because this guy's had a oh, lot okay. of great results. I know, I know the answer then. Go ahead. Toot your own it's, damn it's horn. It's Pablo. <laughs> oh, Pablo. I yeah, thought well, you were going to say okay. Brendan no, I did not say Brendan. I said okay. Pablo. I was like, one of the best singles players on, under the radar, a lefty that can play really good mixed doubles simply because he's lefty, not because he's a period good mixed doubles player, with two women that like to play the left mm -hmm. as a mixed doubles player. Him and James, I was like, there's so much upside for him getting better, too. He's only getting better, and then he's gotten a lot better. I was like, if she picks Pablo, it's going to be a really good team. Yeah, and Pablo's so I think crushing in that scenario, challenger, too. 100%, right? yeah. And I think in that scenario, if they had drafted after Annalie correctly, she would have been that team would have been better than any team I could have possibly created. Hmm. And th theoretically, at that time, James could have fallen to a fourth-round pick as well. James went... James, James, people were building in James's growth at that point, mm -hmm. right? Like they were, they were drafting him for growth. They were drafting him for growth, but I guess they had 24 and 25 and they got Leia as a good pick mm -hmm. at 25th. Yes. She had, she had slipped. They but, drafted James higher than I thought that, right. that, that they would. I thought some other team would get him probably like the fourth pick team. Right. 
Um, but yeah, again, investment picks seem to really be a dominant theme of MLB. Yeah, even mm-hmm. when it's only a six month period, it makes a big right. difference. That's how fast pickleball changes. Right. What was your What was your logic for uh, taking Loom over your brother? Uh, yeah, pretty simple. So people ask me about this. I was like, isn't it kind of obvious? I literally he just, just, he just like I just I, I literally <laughs> just talked about it. we didn't build him as a mixed doubles player in any way. He never plays the left side. It's right. hard to play mixed doubles on the right side. He's an amazing singles player. I'd put Colin and Tyler either, even though Colin doesn't play singles anymore. I know how good he is. He's as good as Tyler not playing or better when he when he does play. So singles is not the consideration. It was entirely mixed, especially with the women I drafted. I knew Megan liked to play the left side. I was like, I want a lefty to play with Megan so that Megan plays better mixed, and that was tough. Yeah. yeah. It, was, it was pretty simple there. Fair enough. Did Colin understand? Or was he he was with me at, at the time where I was like, so Were I you guys like laughing? It. Yes. Yeah, I, I, he was with me, and I was like, so do I take you or I take Tyler? He's just like, I don't know, man. I was like, well, if I draft Tyler and you drop further, you're actually going to be on a better team. You want to go later, not earlier. So I was like, all right, I'll take Tyler. So And we can play a part. It'll be more interesting for us. Can we go back to kind of one of the first things we talked about? So you tweet, you kind of call out the DLAM issue, and you mention a few small paddle brands by name. Mm-hmm. Do you think that was fair to call them out and throw their names out there like that? I think people were tired of everyone tiptoeing around like, this is an issue, but we're not going to say who. Yeah. I was like, Something needs to be said, um, and I, a couple of the companies replied to me. I had a good conversation with one. Um, the other was like, "Hey, we know this was an issue, and we're gonna, we're we're literally fixing it right now." It's right. like fantastic. All right, I will easily say, "You guys shouldn't have messed up to begin with." However, great <laughs> on you. You're fixing it. Yeah. Um, and, and really, that's more the angle that I want. It's not like I have a personal vendetta against any company, but I want <clears> the rules to be accommodated, and when they're not. And some companies are maybe responsible. That's going to be an issue right. for a lot of pros. Okay. And, and what's funny is even though the public didn't know it, all the pros were very in line without even talking to each other. Of these are the the offenders, right? They all said the same ones. Right. It's like, right. I'm going to voice what pros are saying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. Were there any companies I, I, I said that you didn't hear from other pros are just like this is a problem? I think at this point I had heard, like visualized and heard all of them myself in person, so yeah. I, I didn't necessarily even need a conversation with with anybody else right. to identify. What's funny like, is we all know okay. from the sound. The sound's the big thing. <laughs> well, I, I was telling Leia. Leia was in here yesterday. I was watching some match with with Rafa, and then like four courts down, <laughs> I hear, this is over at Red Rock. Four <laughs> courts down, some three five hits a monster drive, and it's a D lamp paddle. I'm like, oh god, <laughs> like, it's like a bullet. <laughs> exactly. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> like you can hear it from across. A, What's funny is. I like the sound. I do. It sounds so good. It sounds like those the first generation gearbox paddles. Yes, you yes, remember those do. ones? Those, yeah, like, those ones were sounds. so hot, and I think it was because they were they were hollow, uh, yeah. almost hollow. There was some foam inside them, but uh, yeah, I'd have to ask Rafa about that. I love that sound, and they got rid of it. I agree. And I was like, why did you get rid of it? He's like, people didn't like it. It's like I loved it. Bring I think it, it bring it back. Sick. Yeah, I think it sounds. Sick. Um, what's his name? Thunder Lopez still has an original. I one. know. He won't switch, and it sounds so funny. Thunder Altoff, Lopez. Altoff <laughs> hates. Like he will. He refuses to play like rec play yeah. with Thunder Lopez. It's trippy. He, it's he like, was, boing. You can't. The, and the thing is, like a dink sounds the same as like an overhead. Yes. Like when you, you can't when tell you the power dink, from the sound at all. It's it still is like a, a, a huge noise, and you don't know how much you're using the sound until it's gone. Right. And you're like, oh, this is weird. I didn't think I was using it before, but now that I don't have it and it's different, it's odd. Mm-hmm. It's funny. Altoff was so pissed off after that. Like, he walked <laughs> off the court. I've never seen Altoff more angry. <laughs> he walks off the court and he's like, Is now I a think- good time to talk about white paddles? Yeah. Sure. Let's do well, it. Well, after I finish my story, go. <laughs> he's like, my bad. I'm going to call eight of my buddies. We're going to and buy gearbox and put them out of business i'm done with this <laughs> this is like three years ago at oh. some some tournament but anyway yeah so tell funny. your white paddle and shit <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah this this one isn't personally for me like i've noticed a a thing uh, i wouldn't say this is something that i was like super vehement about but uh, enough pros have said something where i was like yeah i mean yeah it's probably a, a factor uh so first it's it's probably better to talk about a white background you remember when tournaments used to do white backgrounds and every pro was like please stop we can't see anything right just like the reverse side of a of a banner yeah so a banner that is completely white with some lettering that's not white and you know it'd be on the court and it's in the background and it would be tough to see the ball um kind of the same phenomenon 
But gosh, I'm just killing it with the, uh, the the baseball references today. Do you know what a batter's eye is? Yep, I think we talked about that yeah. before. Mm-hmm. Ba- batter's eye you is. You weren't paying attention to me. I've talked about that before. <laughs> yeah. It's a consistent background on en- every MLB field where the background behind the pitcher is not white or any light color. It's almost always a dark green or similar to that. Yeah. And so the player, the the batters can see the ball. Yeah. Okay. We didn't have that in pickleball until all the pros were like, "Please stop with the white backgrounds." Right. Stop. Yeah. And even lettering is tough. And you'll notice sometimes we'll pros will go when we have the boards, the electronic boards, we'll say, turn the brightness down because the white letters we can't see. Right. Yeah. And they'll, they'll do that. Um, so backgrounds are a big issue. And now the issue that we're talking about now is people that are using very bright white paddles. Uh, they hide the ball for a little bit. Uh, you, it's just same concept as a white background. It's hard to see. Uh, why I haven't really talked about that before is I don't actually know what a standard would be of you know, when you say don't have a white paddle, it's like, well, what does that mean? How white can we be? And you need right. a standard for that. And sure, maybe let's have a standard of, of brightness. Like we can't have reflective paddles. That's obviously a no-no with sun. Um, so yeah, we probably do need something for that with white paddles. I just don't know what that is because I haven't looked into how you would define color, honestly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I agree. I think that's kind of an issue because you, you just don't want the equipment to be causing like visual effects on your mm-hmm. on your opponents and i yeah. think it is it is noticeable where you can lose the the ball on a white paddle but again it's it's tough to tell a a, a company that they can't market a white exactly, paddle because they look so nice exactly white they looks look nice. great it's like, you can't use white it's like that's tough <laughs> yeah it, it is tough maybe it's a pro thing mm-hmm. right like yeah you know or uh i mean maybe it's just i i think there's a balance of how dull that the white is i feel like i've i don't know about you but i've struggled more personally with really bright whites in the sunlight that's what yeah I, that's, that's, what I the, that's see. The, the main thing like yeah. when you when your your first franklin paddle was like a it was very dull it was a dull white mm-hmm. right and it, it was, was almost, almost like a clearish or, or darkish a natural hue it was uh, yeah. like bone white right and but more like a yeah very very bright whites seem to reflect the mm-hmm. sun a little bit more yeah. and yes yeah, so there's like i know for a while there was the the old onyx paddle the white onyx paddle that could be a stroke you know the, 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 the evoke one evoke pro evoke pro i think evoke, you used no, it for a while. evoke premiere evoke premiere yeah i used it for a while the, that, oh, that, that one, one was that pretty one bright catch? white that, that one would catch a little bit okay the the predominant offenders now i think that people are complaining about though i actually haven't personally experienced it is the white selkirks yeah those have the most white and they're the most bright i think tyson's has some well, gold think, on it which i is think tough. tyson's is the one that people are are talking gold about. could blend like, with the ball a little bit. white and white offset with that red like mm-hmm. off of james's paddle not too bad doesn't really bother me uh-huh. uh, i've played him a couple times like yeah same those, i haven't struggled with the white and, and those and don't red. bug me but i could uh, i could see somebody like actually yana's paddle which is very white and has is that that white vulcan of, yeah the all white yeah that mm-hmm. one that one seems like it could be an issue mm-hmm. and then tyson's white and gold I do you think. struggle with it when it's you're playing on a covered court where there's no sun do i um i can't recall i haven't played against i haven't pl- actually played against either of them. i don't think i've played against one i have played against those paddles but not in the sun yeah and i, I, I think that's why i haven't really struggled because i've always struggled when it's sun on white mm-hmm. i haven't played tyson in a lo- little while and i haven't played yana in a in a long time but i do i do think that that's probably an issue because I've, I've seen it uh, before and and might as well attempt to address it yeah while while we're at it <laughs> while we're at it <laughs> yeah and I, I think there's definitely a lot of complaints that you by you know people in the public of hey just play the rules are rules and all that it's like well there's always an evolution of games and rules and sports are still changing rules whether to make it more interesting or better or whatever it's like you don't want to be hasty with the new rules you make you don't want to be overbearing with rules but that doesn't mean you don't want to change them change is is great as long as you're trying to head in a good direction generally agreed (laughs) i like to see i like to see growth and and see where things go for a little bit and then evaluate whether they are a an issue or problematic for the future of Mm -hmm. the the game i I definitely think it's a common thing (laughs) it's definitely a common thing to either overreact or react too quickly to something that that is a common theme with not just sports but a lot of things so there's there's been a theme of kind of pros harboring their their issues right where it's sort of like collectively understood DLAM, for example, and it doesn't become an issue until it's an issue. And then all of a sudden it's a big it issue. It seems very sudden, doesn't right? it? Right. Yeah. And that's mostly because pros talk with each other, but they don't bring it up very publicly in exactly. any way until it's like, oh, suddenly everyone's talking about it. Because usually when yeah. one person, one pro says it to the public uh, of really any problem, 
everyone then feels the liberty to do so because sure. they're not the one that initially said it, so they don't get torched. Right. Um, but pros generally talk to each other for months before, I think with the the spin problem last year, yep. I think we were talking about it for months, yep. for, for a while before it actually really came up. And mm -hmm. I think that is, again, a testament to growing pains in pickleball. There needs to be a better system, like a pro player committee. And we had a pro player committee with the PPA for a while. There were like eight pros on it. But uh, we lost our player liaison for a bit because he had some matters to attend to. So we haven't had a uh, pro player council meeting in a while, which is probably why an issue like this arose. And there definitely needs to be a better system for for fixing problems because right now it's just pros talking and nothing happens. Okay. Right? Are there any other kind of issues behind the scenes bubbling to the surface that might be the next topic? Like. What are you guys talking about behind the scenes that maybe haven't seen the light of day at this point? Is so there anything? I did bring up of? the white paddle for that reason. Yeah, white paddle. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? I think um, more transparency uh, when it comes to certain things. So, like, uh, and this isn't a knock on the BPA because they don't—they're not really responsible for testing paddles that much yet. Like, they don't understand exactly how to do it best. So, there's not a lot of transparency because they don't really know what to do other than follow USA Pickleball for now. But more transparency on that, like, what were the test results for right. such and such? And right. Here's a video of it. You know, make sure it's done well, uh, which we'd call transparency. Uh, and then we did that for, like, draws, for instance. You know, like, how you draw the random seeds out. for like, hey, we need either a player there or we need a video of it. It needs to be done professionally and making sure there's you know it's completely transparent uh, so I, th I think that is one thing a lot of the players have been talking about yeah hmm. yeah i think i think a lot of the, i think also players are are more likely to just bring things to the forefront quicker like i think now people are just spouting their their thoughts a lot quicker than mm -hmm. than previously yes um to my knowledge like last year when we we're talking about the spin issues like that went pretty much unsaid for several months and the delamination stuff has been part of somewhat public conversation well definitely when when you said it but i was even kind of getting out there a little bit before yeah, that it definitely was yeah um, i think i was just the first one to say it on social basically yeah yeah so uh, this the spin issue i think didn't come to light as fast most likely because most of the pros were pretty unaware of what even the standard was so they're like yeah that seems spinnier than other stuff but did it pass? I don't know. And also there were very few pros that were able to play with those paddles. Now there's right. more pros. It was, it was only paddles. the unsponsored players that exactly. were using it, right? It was a couple of people that were able to to use it. And mm -hmm. when it's only like one or two people that might not even be good, like just say, ah, oh, beat them, whatever. Exactly. Whatever. exactly. Yeah. Um, there's nothing that I can really think of. I mean, there's the there's the PED conversation <laughs> that's been that's been brought up. Yeah, what to do you life. think? What's what's your take on that? I don't think it exists in Pickleball. Okay. Uh, just i don't see it <laughs> like i don't see anybody that is uh, what i consider a freak athlete um and even if they were a freak athlete it is well within what i consider the bounds of completely able um without drugs and then just using not that performance enhancing drugs can't help you in pickleball they absolutely could i just i don't see it spoken like somebody who's hiding something <laughs> <laughs> yeah well what I, I, I like that because it's funny i would be the last person to be accused of that because i just don't even look athletic on the court like i <laughs> i moved the ball well i anticipate but it's not like i'm uh i'm jumping or he's out there like deckle or tyler and i'm not moving like you or fed or anything so yeah and my stamina is not even good guys i'm not an athlete i just have good eye hand coordination <laughs> um yeah, no, I, it's it's tough to say whether anybody is or, or, or isn't. There's you can't say for been sure no, like a right? a lot of accusations, but I think the issue is that there is an incentive structure to, to try it. I don't know whether it'll work or not, but mm -hmm. might as well get righted up or, yeah. and, or in my, tried in my case, some form of drug. You know, the paddle's obvious. In a drug scenario, I say you're innocent until proven guilty, and it's going to be a while until you have testing because it's expensive. That's yeah, all. and that's that's one of the things that I think is is overlooked too. I don't think this is realistic to test for for several years. It's so expensive. It's, it's crazy. unbelievably expensive. Yeah. And people say, "Well, why don't you just go get a get a piss test?" And like, <laughs> there's there's more to it. <laughs> there's a lot there's more, more to, to it. it. Yeah, trust uh, me, it, I did a lot of costs research. A on lot it. of money. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and in the meantime, that would provide players with an incentive to try that because they won't be tested. But I think you enter an entire world that a lot of players will not want to get into. Of, I mean, that is just want a super terrible look if you did get caught for any reason um it's to my knowledge i don't know much about it but i don't think it's healthy um 
and like just even figuring out what would be good for pickleball is a whole other thing. It's just there's so many issues there, and I still think pickleball is small. Yes, there's a lot to be gained in pickleball, but it is still relatively small to where I just I don't see it. <laughs> yeah, small. you'd really need like an expert to like help you through. Mm -hmm. This is how you do it, right? Yeah. Or this is what would be. You need somebody with extensive pickleball knowledge. And also both. expensive, an expensive both. drug knowledge, right. right? And I don't know, maybe that person exists. Yeah, I mean, they probably exist, but hard to find. <laughs> and and yeah, what I go back you, to uh, pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you search for that? Uh, like uh, pickleball steroids near me now. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's tough. You need to know some people. Uh, but when people are, you know, say uh, pro looks bigger or faster on the court. I was just like, yeah, they probably work hard. Like you, there is a very real thing called the gym where if you go and work hard, you can get better at movement and strength and stamina and all those things. And I'm sure a lot of us try to do that, but some are better at it than others. And that makes a big difference. I mean, I don't think anyone's calling that Tyson's on drugs and that guy's always been a beast because he works out like an animal in the gym. That's why I think he's how he is. Um, so yeah, anybody can, can do that. It's just hard work. Hmm. All right. You walked in here with uh, the whole uh, you know, iPad full of notes. Yeah. It was, it was just my written version of, of the delamination issues just cause okay. I formed my thoughts in the shower last night. of just like, how would I explain this to people? Cause it was just around, you know, mechanical testing procedures and right. rules and it's a little more complex than, than people know. Um, so I just form my thoughts and I find it helpful to write them down. Nothing else interesting in there that, uh, no, that was, it was entirely on it. I mean, I can show you the whole essay. It was just all about that that issue, and uh, I, I can post When's the that version. Twitter, can we? Yeah, wait. Can we, can <laughs> yeah, that we? will not fit in Twitter. It's like two thousand oh, characters. Not, that's, <laughs> a, that's a blog Premium. right there. Yeah, you uh, didn't pay for Elon's. Uh, can you verified status? Is verified? Can you post? I think you more? can go up to like. 2, I've just gotten on Twitter. I like just started. Yeah, but you're popping off. I mean, I'm, I find it very fun. It <laughs> it's is just like, is this what the Donald felt like in the Oval Office? <laughs> just I'm going to start some stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. There's nothing better than taking a dump and, and dumping on people. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. I mean, Twitter's fun. It's it gets stuff out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can I can post that after this podcast on Facebook if you want. It's just. The no, literal, no, no. written, no, no, no. eloquent it's, version of no, no, what no, I no. said. No, no, It's going on the dink. It's going on the blog. <laughs> okay. Well, I can send it to you. <laughs> Money. Perfect. Um, any other, like, kind of lingering issues out there as far as, like, how pickleball could improve, whether it's the pro game, mm. equipment, anything you're, like, thinking about pretty consistently is, like, okay, pickleball needs this in order mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, just be a more... One, one thing I'd like game. to see, and this isn't uh, a big issue, it's more like, can we add this to make it better? And I think it's better yeah. for everybody is uh, more concrete playing times for matches, not just these continual streams. I think you can do so much more with um, making a show out of a match, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just like any other regular sporting event does. Just like, all right, semifinals is at this time. Finals, at, I mean, we do finals at this time, but every match before the finals be like, it is at this time, yeah. or how tennis does is not before this time. So people know when to tune in. You can right. hype it up a little bit. Right, right, right. right. Um, so there's that. And, and maybe that takes, you know, uh, spreading the tournament out a little more. Maybe you add an extra day or two so the matches are, are played less frequently mm -hmm. and then you can hype them up a little bit more. But I think that would be that would be great for, for pickleball people. The pros get more of a spotlight. Yeah. You know, a lot of pros, they don't normally have a spotlight. Maybe they don't make finals. They're much more in it when it's like, hey, this match is going to be a good one. It's at this time. Yeah. And everyone gets hyped for it. Uh, night matches, more night matches would be really cool. I think, again, people get hyped at night. Turn on the lights and uh, make sure there's good lighting. People are more likely to tune into the live stream too. Oh, at night. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. I mean, you just got to give them a schedule. That's Going it. Going yeah. back to your your last point, there's nothing worse than walking through like a venue or somebody texting you like, "Hey, what time do you play?" No idea. Literally no idea. <laughs> every uh, every fan always asks that, and right? Then, <laughs> and then no idea after that. Just that's none. What I tell everybody. It's so funny. Every pro has to respond the same way to every fan, which is, "What time do you play?" Well, I started this time. Don't know. That's it's, always the reply. It's rough. I, one, one idea that I've had is I think it'd be interesting to have basically all three events played out of the course of like three days mm -hmm. or, or or four days, mm -hmm. right? Um, but basically like you have your, your let's say there's morning singles, there's middle of the day doubles, and there's evening mixed, mm -hmm. right? Or you put whatever is highest rated on the – or your best matchups at night. Prime time. Prime time. Right, and so you have a, a nine a.m., a noon, and a and say a five, and you advance through one step of the draw every day. 
So you could be, you could lose your singles match on Wednesday. You're out in singles, but you still have, you won your, your mixed and your men's and then you play the next day and you, you advance to the draw day by day, Mm -hmm. but you're also playing three draws in a given day. Interesting schedule wise. That might be most, that might be, that might be the best for, um, pipe TV scheduling, all that. And it probably the only issue I would see with it is players needing to switch from one to the other and having like an issue with that. I'd just be like, I don't want to play three different divisions on the same day because I'm in a different mindset for each. And I'd say, yeah, you can adapt to that. Maybe not ideal, but you could adapt to that. So I could see that being worth experimenting. Or like we talked about with nationals, just more days, period. If you have six days and every event is over two days, maybe you can make every match best out of five. That gives it much more potential to be a real event where people are tuning in because it's longer when something can be 20 minutes it's hard to be like all right i'm going to tune in at two and be done by 220 <laughs> fair depends who's playing <laughs> yeah you can have some marathon three game matches what do you think the longest match you've ever played best out of three is uh it might have been me and altoff playing against you and colin last year at the beginning of the year was it florida in florida. tampa that was really long altoff and colin were again just, just going forever. at it forever <laughs> and the ball and was so we mushy <laughs> i think we actually snuck yeah, a game you, off you of you guys mm-hmm. and uh yeah that was that was forever that's that's probably got to be the, one of, one the, of the softest balls i played with for sure yeah it was, what, it was 90, and 90 degrees and then altoff and colin altoff <laughs> still has to this day has never sped up a pickleball <laughs> <laughs> oh it's too good what about you back end um i was just thinking I think I, I mean, think you the longest best of five. So let's say like a per game, like okay, longest yeah, per game per game. Yeah. So the one I can think of is I played Tyson in singles. Surprising, it was a singles match um, in the lakes when they used to run that Marson's Old Country Club in 2019. I played him in the singles final. Um, had beaten him earlier, so it was come around. Uh, lost the best out of three. Every game was like. 11 9 14 12 da, 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 da. lost the best out of three 16 14 in the in the game to 15 i think it took four games two hours brutal and yeah. that's singles too yeah well, yes. that's singles i wouldn't be able to walk yeah. that's crazy oh, yikes yikes um okay one thing let's do let's do something for the amateurs here okay okay you're the best player in the world you look at the amateur because we're not just a gossip pod okay <laughs> okay we hope not <laughs> eh, we, we might be that i mean we we do love our gossip <laughs> people love gossip and they love drama uh but for the amateurs watching looking to improve their game can you give me something that they should be working on particularly given the developments of pickleball lately how the game has progressed over the past couple years something that amateurs should be more focused on than they used to be <laughs> something that is a small tweak that could have a lot of upside yep. or maybe it's something just off court training that'll impact their on court play. Yeah. So I, I've said this one a lot before, so it's not going to be something that I would necessarily associate with, you know, developments and pick but it's something that still tons of people do and is just going to kill your game in a lot of ways. And that's just using your wrist too much. And I emphasize it so much. And that is your wrist is a hinge that is entirely for controlling the direction of the ball. You mm-hmm. should not be moving it as you're hitting. There's some exceptions to that rule, but mm-hmm. the general rule, especially for amateurs, is lock your wrist out. Then you're just moving it like this in whatever way. This is great at controlling the direction of the paddle. This, very not strong unless you're Henry Bernardo and you can admin uh, a ball real real quick. But, uh, you yeah, know, it, it's entirely used for just controlling direction of the ball, and you'll find that it's pretty flexible, so you can control where the ball goes directionally really well as long as you keep it still while you're doing it. Whereas if you use this as you're hitting... Sure, you can hit a sick shot occasionally, but it's very hard to time that, and it's just not strong at all. So right. that is my one thing that I almost always tell everybody, and uh, I probably use mine too much still. Yeah, yeah. Don't do what we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, like the exception is that rule is obviously an overhead. You're going to do this uh, ground stroke. Sometimes you're going to use a little more, and then like a speed up where you're in an optimum position and the ball's in front of you. Yeah, you can do this to get quick power, but in that case, you're not going to miss hit the ball because the ball's right in front of you. Yeah. Whereas anything other than those situations, don't do it. Got it. All right. That's a good place, Dan. I think that's a good place. Perfect. Sweet. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie, Dyler has gone.